Karen, first and foremost, thanks for the time. Congratulations. Has the glow even begun to wear, wear off yet? No, I, I just got goosebumps listening to you. <laughs> but thanks for having me, Rick. Well, that's pretty good because as we were in break there, I said this was an exciting weekend for you. And you said, oh, no, it wasn't just exciting. It was epic. <laughs> How long did it take for the magnitude of this accomplishment to soak in for you and the teams? I think it's still soaking in. You know, we're still, um, you know, receiving congratulations from, um, you know, Dr. Christina Johnson, you know, texted me today, you know, invited us to, to go out to dinner. And so, you know, we're just very happy to be able to make our university and our uh, leadership team very proud. Was this historic double, Karen, something that you or the teams discussed at any point during the season? Yes, we discussed it indoors when we were second in both places. And we knew that we had an opportunity in, you know, with the level and the magnitude of the quality of student athletes that we had. But we really didn't look at going after it until we got to the championships. And then we just decided, you know, we have some powerful student athletes here, some talented student athletes here. We've got Olympians right here. And so why not let's go after it right now? And um, so once the, the indoor season, me, the indoor season sort of crescendoed into an opportunity for us to really do well during the outdoor season. Excuse me. That's okay, Karen. It happens all the time. This is the world we live in right now with our devices and cell phones. Uh, Karen, at, I didn't at what even know point, I had it on me. <laughs> no worries. At what point in this meet did you actually feel like the reality of the double was truly happening? After the, after the second day, and what we did, we counted up the number of qualifiers for the finals on Sunday, and we knew that we had, we were sort of, we figured we could have 176 points on the women's side. We weren't worried about that. Um, the men's side, we knew that we had a fewer um, qualifiers for uh, for Sunday than Iowa did, but we also knew that our bullets were stronger. And so we just felt like um, we can we can pull this thing off, but I tell you what really happened, the pole vaulters and our throwers, they got together and they decided if they're gonna win, if we're gonna win the men, then they had to show up. And that's what happened. You know, our pole vaulters showed up strong, our uh, throwers gave us the 10 points, um, at the during the finals, uh, the final few events of the championships, and um, you know our runners took care of the oval, and so once our our field people took over, um, or added to our point total, we became um, very confident that we could win, and um, it was something that for me I had hoped that our women had won before, and the men sat back and watched. Our men had won before, and the women sat back and watched. It was my dream for our men and women to win together and get a chance to celebrate together. That was, that was my dream. Our staff bought into it. Our student athletes wanted, to, wanted it to happen. I just had a great group of uh, coaches and a great group of student athletes to make this moment happen for our program. Yeah, always special when that dream becomes reality. On the women's team, Karen, 11 female student athletes on the all Big Ten first team. You set a meet record. You win by a margin of 85 points, which is almost unheard of. <laughs> how talented, how do you describe the level of talent specifically on this women's team? You know, like I said, the, uh, we've got two Olympians on the, on the women's team, with, you know, with um, Ad, uh, Navia Battle and Adelaide Aquila. And we've got, you know, uh, women who have um, just worked their tails off, you know. Look at Addie Engel getting second in the, in the uh, 5,000. We had, you know, Alexis Piles, you know, she, she came out the gate for a strong, win, winning the heptap, the heptap line, which was the first event. Then she went on and won the long jump, which was um, close in, uh, in the, um, in the uh, format. And uh, then got second in the, um, in the 100 meter hurdles. Her sister, followed up Jamie in the triple jump and got second. They went one, two in the triple jump. So we had some strong field people. And then, um, you know, our runners, you know, going one, two, three, you know, I can remember sweeping um, the hundred in 2012, I believe, when Christina Manning, who's an Olympian, um, 
was part of that was part of that group. Christina Manning, Madison McNary, and Chesna Sykes. In 2012, we swept the 100. So this was a time we did it again. You know, we just had an amazing show of student athletes. You know, our hurdlers showed up, our jumpers showed up. You know, and they wanted it. So that was the 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 biggest thing for our program is that the athletes wanted it. The coaches prepared them, and let's just go. So when the gun went off and um, the competitions began, we just did uh, what we were prepared to do, what we had trained very hard over the years to do, and uh, wanted to make this a very special year because of the seniors that were leaving, um, the great magnitude of talent that we knew was going to walk out the door, and we wanted it to happen for each other. And so I think when you decide together a particular goal and you decide that we're going to make it happen and, and do it for each other, I think that's really special and that's what made it happen. Karen, you've discussed it. There are so many different disciplines that go into an outdoor track and field meet. You have runners, you have jumpers, you have hurdlers, you have throwers. How do you and your staff ensure that each athlete that's part of your program is getting the training, getting the advice and the guidance that they need to be successful? I think it starts with uh, the leadership of the coaches. You know, we, you know, I have, I'm fortunate enough to have a group of coaches who We'll, col we'll collaborate with one another. We communicate every week, every Monday. We have um, a staff meeting where we talk about every particular issue or any issues that we have with the program. We talk about our student athletes who are doing well, and we talk about the student athletes who, who really need some arms wrapped around them. So I think the communication piece of it is really important. And then we also have a goal. We have a, a common goal. It's not about each coach having a particular silo of student athletes. It is about making ourselves one major tribe um, amongst, um, uh, amongst ourselves so that we can go out and um, perform as one team against all the other best teams, that, uh, all the other great teams right here in the Big Ten and in the country. We want to win. We want to be the best. All right, Karen, well, let's finish there because you talk about not just the Big Ten, but the country, nationals in Eugene, Oregon in the beginning of June. You mentioned some of the athletes that have backgrounds as Olympians and wonderful things that they've accomplished at the international level. Which athletes should we be keeping an eye on as we start to focus toward Eugene in early June? Well, on the men's side, I'd say we have to look at Eric, uh, Eric Harrison. He won the 100 in a, in a very magnificent manner. Um, he represented Trinidad in the Olympics. We've got to look at Tyler Johnson, who has um, consistently won the Big Ten for us, as well as a, a semifinalist in the Olympic trials last year. Our, our relays on the, both the men's and women's side, 4 by one 4 by 4 are very strong. Um, Sean, uh, we've got uh, a great uh, Sean Miller in uh, the high jump. We've got good triple jumpers, you know, with um, Clarence, um, Clarence Foot tally. And on the women's side, we've got... Adelaide Aquila, who is going to, you know, try to um, defend her outdoor national championship title. Uh, Anavia Battle, I've mentioned her before. And then Jamie Robinson. We've got some folks that are in the top 10 in the country in their respective event areas. So we hope to be able to take um, the relays on the women's side. You know, Nia Bussey just really ran a, a fine race um, in the 100 meters at the Big Ten. And so we add all those people together with um, our 4x4 four by four, four by four relays, our 4x1 relay, and we expect them to make the national championship. So we're going we're gonna to do our best next week at the regional championships, and um, they take, um, you know, the top t uh, 12 in each event. And uh, Alexis Piles is already pre-qualified with the, with the multi-events with the heptathlon because, um, you know, with her performance at her point performance at the Big Ten Championships. So we're going to give it a, as strong a, a shot as we can. Well, Karen, I know it was an amazing weekend for you and both of the Buckeye outdoor track and field teams. We truly appreciate the time. Best of luck, continued luck for all those athletes at the regionals and at the nationals. Thanks for the time today. Thanks for having me. Here's a moonshot. When you see it come off the bat, you're just like, oh my gosh, that's gone. Sydney Gray, a solo shot. That's a well hit ball. I did that. Like, I hit a home run. Like, that's something to be proud of. And I think when I, like, see that as I'm running the bases, it's just a moment of, like, you did that. 
sometimes it, you just know for sure it's going over. It just like feels so good and you're just like, oh my gosh, and you just like want to watch it go over the fence. <laughs> it's exciting to see them, their work pay off in that kind of way. And you know, that knuckle bump that I do, knuckle bump, pat on the back, uh, that's been going on for years. And then, you know, they create, every team creates what happens at home plate. And this team has created a hug and the passing of the, of the necklace. What we brought on this year, which is really cool, is like the Nebraska chain. We have our home run chain, like we kind of started that this year, and I think that's just something that brings us like energy and excitement when we have the chain and we get to give it to someone who hits the home run. I think that's something special that we do. Everyone just gets really excited. I think we all get super pumped up. We start saying chain gang, chain gang. Yeah, it's crazy because we've hit so many and it just is exciting and everyone gets loud in the dugout. Diane Miller is our hitting coach here at the University of Nebraska. As they're in the hole and coming up to uh, being on deck, she's having conversations with them. And, and every hitter is different. Some conversations might be more extensive, some might be more tactical, some might be just stay where you are. She is really good at knowing each of our swings and how we understand our swings. So the way she talks to one player could be different to how she talks to another player, but it's so specified to each person on the team. And I think that's one of her best qualities is she knows how to communicate with each and every one of us like in the way that we understand it best. She prepares us more than any coach, I believe. <laughs> it's amazing. We prepare by just watching film. She sets up so many different stations to help us in all the ways that she thinks are possible. With all of her knowledge that she has on like hitting and like that she has done this for a long time, like everyone just like trusts her. A lot of the stuff we do is more like drastic, I guess. We'll do like more than what it would be in like a game, just so like we can prepare for that and like be ready for whatever we get in the game. One of the things that I always uh, respected about Diane is that she put together, when she was at Colorado State, all of her teams were very offensive and there were always national leaders in different statistical categories that I thought was important. Power, slugging, on-base percentage, uh, things that lead to runs. Obviously she was a good recruiter and she knows what she's looking for in a hitter. And I think if you have that combination, you're gonna put together a lot of successful teams. These are your updated Big Ten standings. You're asking me, Rick, why is there a big blue line in the middle of the standings? That's to signify that only the top eight teams will get an invite to Omaha in next week's Big Ten tournament after the final game of the regular season is played on Saturday. The Minnesota's been eliminated. Ohio State as well because the Buckeyes don't play in conference this weekend. Michigan State still has an outside chance. The other teams that are jumbled around that blue line are all battling. It basically comes down to seven teams for four spots. With all that info handy, we bring in Michael <laughs> Huff to make sense of all of it. To try to make sense of all of this. And the schedule makers made it pretty interesting this weekend as well. Yeah, I mean, you want to talk about something crazy. You think about that five, six, seven, eight that are sitting right now. They're playing one, two, three, four. I mean, how exciting so that it's almost guaranteed what we saw on that graphic is not going to be the eight teams that go to Omaha. So I'm going to start with Purdue, who sit at number five. They're playing against Illinois number four. So they have to feel like we control our destiny. We're over 500. We just got to win one and we're there. Now it starts to get really fun. You start looking at the combinations of Michigan having to play Rutgers. You look at Purdue having to play Maryland. I mean, very likely that these teams could get swept. And if that does happen, now all of a sudden those teams below the line, the Nebraskas, the Northwesterns, even the Michigan States have a chance to jump that line. Now, what's interesting is that Michigan State is really kind of threading a needle here. Like They have to sweep all three games against Nebraska, and they have to hope that Purdue, who is 9-10, gets swept. And that's probably the only way that they're going to get there. Plus, they need some help, they need on, some top help on top of that. Right. So kind of crazy. Now, what's interesting is that they have to play against Nebraska. So you're talking about a Nebraska club who's thinking, if I can take two out of three, definitely if I sweep, I am putting myself in a chance to get there. But if I take one out of three, if I lose two, I'm done. And even taking one out of three, that guarantees Michigan State is out.
Yep. So this is going to be really exciting to see how those two battle, especially those first two days. I think that's why that win by Illinois was not just huge for the Illini in terms of their place in the Big Ten standings. And we'll talk about the top four coming up in just a little bit. I think the impact was even greater on Nebraska because that would have been a huge win for huge them. Win. And giving them a little bit of a breathing room heading into this weekend series against Michigan State Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Big yep. Ten Plus for all of those games. So you touched on Purdue and you briefly mentioned Michigan. Michigan's in a really tough spot because late in the year their schedule was absolutely backloaded they started playing well four or five weeks ago and then they could not keep it rolling and because of matchups with Maryland because of this weekend against Rutgers I mean the Wolverines are really up against it well and unfortunately for the Wolverines their pitchers just have not been able to take that next step forward uh, their bats were coming alive and it got them into that position but you think about one and two against Indiana one and two against Purdue again good ball clubs but not great ball clubs and then you get swept by Maryland and what do you follow that up with the number two team in the Big Ten Rutgers who is just having an incredible year so they really had their backs against the wall and it would be crazy to think that a month ago, they were sitting in that number five spot, and if they get swept this weekend, there's a really good chance that they're going to be on the outside looking in this year. Another one of those teams that we felt a lot better about four, six weeks ago, your alma mater, Northwestern. It has not been a good month for the Wildcats, and once again, they're going to need some help. The good news for Northwestern is that they play a team in Minnesota that yeah. doesn't really have anything to play for. Right. I mean, it's always fun when you can play the spoiler. And again, the Ohio States, the, the Minnesotas, they like doing that. And what has Ohio State done the last couple weekends? Oh, they went to Northwestern and swept them. They came back the next week and took two out of three. So Ohio State, again, did what they wanted to do. They ended the year on a positive note. I guarantee Minnesota's thinking the same thing. Look, no offense to Northwestern, but how do we end on a positive note? We make sure someone else doesn't go to the Big Ten. But like you said, Northwestern. Western was right there three weeks ago and all of a sudden have kind of stumbled down the line. Ironically, they still have a chance going to Minnesota. If they can sweep, they're going to give themselves a chance to see what else happens at the top of the standings. I find it so interesting this year when we are discussing Maryland and Rutgers as two of the four absolute no doubters, but we're discussing Michigan as potential issue, Nebraska, who is the preseason favorite Crazy to think as about. a yep. potential issue, and Indiana, who really kind of started the Big Ten's climb back yep. up national respect inside Big Ten baseball. Indiana's also in that situation. Now, they are 10 and 11, but they have a really tough three-game series coming up against Iowa. You know you're going to have to face Adam Mazur, who <laughs> exactly. has been absolutely lights right. out. So if you drop that game, you're in a spot where you absolutely have to take the next two, right. or you need help from teams below you. Yes. Again, you're in that spot that we've talked all year. If you can get to 500 in the Big Ten, you've got to feel really good about your chances of making the Big Ten tournament. And guess what? They need to go 2-1 and one against Iowa to get there. Now, what Adam Mazur has done this year is incredible. I mean, you know, you tip your cap to Ryan Ramsey in that perfect game, but the consistency that this man has shown over the Big Ten season so far, it's crazy. Twice gave up two runs and once was in the ninth inning before he came out. Every other start, it's either been a shutout or one run. Every start has been six innings, only one, and then seven, eight, nine. So he has done everything. So for Indiana, like you said, you're thinking, I've got to take two out of three because I can control my destiny. But in reality, you're thinking, i got to sweep because I'm probably not winning that first game against Adam. And I've been saying this for a couple of weeks. I've been saying that the seeds and maybe the eight teams to qualify for the Big Ten tournament would not be known until the final day of the regular season. Exactly. I may go right. a step further. This game, Indiana-Iowa, the third game of that series, is the last game of the regular season. It's a 9 Eastern, 8 p.m. Central time start That's in right. Iowa City. Yep. So not just the last day. We but may, may, may not know yes. until the very last <laughs> game is finished, which would be very symbolic of the yes. year that we have been enjoying in Big Ten baseball. All right, we're back. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mike Huff, top of the standings. Top four, Maryland, Rutgers, Iowa, Illinois. Maryland has the tiebreaker over Rutgers because the Terps took two out of three from the Scarlet Knights a couple of weekends ago. But nobody's really worried about that right now. Everybody is just worried about the games in front of them. And for Maryland, they're on the road, three-game series against Purdue. Well, and this is, for Maryland, again, we're talking national perspective. They have worked their way into a top 10 RPI. They have worked their way in the top 15 national rankings in just about everyone's rankings. So for them, it's to continue to maintain we are – the program this year in the Big Ten. And we want that number one seed. We want to win the regular season. How do you do that? 
you sweep. You don't go two out of three, you take care of your business. And even though you're going on the road, a scrappy ball club in Purdue, you know that they're thinking, we want to get in there, we want to win this outright. Now, Rutgers is also on the road. They take on Michigan, and the Scarlet's Knight, Scarlet Knights know that Maryland has that game in hand. So if Maryland takes two out of three, Rutgers has the to door. take three out of three. Exactly. Rutgers knows that the only way they have a chance, in all likelihood, is to sweep. Right, and, and I tell you what, you talk about sometimes you'd rather be lucky than good. When do you play teams? Are they hot? Are they struggling? Right now, unfortunately, Michigan has been struggling. One and two, one and two, zero oh and three in their last three weekends. So for Michigan, you're thinking, again, we control our destiny. We just got to win a couple games here. We go two and one. Don't worry about sweeping. Don't worry about getting too much momentum. We know we're in the tournament. We go one and two. I'm not too sure. And you don't want to go 0 and 3 because, again, Rutgers is hoping that Maryland maybe stubs a toe, you know, throws a fifth or sixth pitcher just to get some guys some rest. So now you can jump in and win that regular season title. So for Michigan, ugh. I don't see that happening. Not with a regular season title. You're not throwing in a fifth or sixth guy, especially if you have until when? You have until Thursday, True. Wednesday, so, I should say, yep. to get your pitchers rested. Uh, Indiana Iowa, we touched on just a little bit, but I think with this Iowa team, I've been saying it for a while, I think a really dangerous team, especially once you get in to single and double elimination postseason scenarios. And, that, and that's what they're looking at right now. They're looking at, you know, We've worked our way to showing on a national scale how good our pitching staff is. The problem is their RPI continues to hover just outside of a comfort zone. So they need to not just keep going two and one, which they've done the last three weekends. They really needed to have a couple sweeps to bump them out of that low 60s, high 50s, maybe into the low 50s, high 40s but going into the Big Ten tournament. Even if I don't win, if I win two or three games, I'm there. You mentioned it. Adam Mazur has done everything, and he sets the table for these guys. If he can do that, and if the bats can come alive, if they play that solid defense, and they can sweep this weekend, yep. now, again, you start to feel more comfortable that regardless of what happens through the Big Ten tournament, here is that third Big Ten team that's positioning themselves pretty well whether we win or we don't win. And lastly, let's touch on Illinois. They're now outside the top 80 in RPI. You feel like you want to build some momentum because right now for Dan Harlev and company, if you want to get to the NCAAs, you got to win it all next week in Omaha. Exactly. And again, that's what you're thinking is that, look, how do I position my team? Position player-wise, batting average-wise, batting order-wise, pitching staff, defense. How do I get these kids realizing that this weekend is really not that important? It's to build yep. something going into the Big Ten tournament. And if we can do the right way or, or a bad hop or something, how do we get that momentum to feel really good that when we go in that Big Ten tournament, we're one of those top four seeds, so we get to wear the home jerseys first, but we can beat anybody if we play our game.